Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Chapter 12, Knocking from the Inside Tonight we recited the Metta Sutta, the Loving Kindness Sutta, which is a core teaching of the Buddha. The Linked Discourses 1.8, the Karaniya Metta Sutta. Despite the fact that lots of people teach about metta, I don't think it's emphasized enough as a substantial practice in itself. It's often kind of treated as something you do on the side before you get on with the serious business of reflection or insight. But as you can see, this sutta works through a series of developments. The beginning talks about character development, and then it defines what goodwill is, extending to all beings spending quite a bit of time going through categories of beings which are to be included in your profound goodwill. It ends with one who transcends the senses and does not return to this world. In the classical teachings of the Buddha, he talks about his monks and nuns dwelling in loving kindness day and night, some for their whole lives. The Buddha speaks in praise of that. There's no downside to it. In itself, friendliness is not the liberation, but it is the springboard and naturally leads right to the edge of understanding. The Buddha emphasizes that if you are established in virtue, there is no need to wish. May my mind be lucid and clear. For one established in virtue, lucidity, clarity, samadhi naturally arises. One established in samadhi has no need to wish, may I gain insight. Insight naturally arises and swells out of samadhi. I would say that insight perhaps doesn't arise naturally and swell out of samadhi if you have no familiarity with the basic three characteristics that the Buddha teaches again and again, anicca, dukkha, anatta. But it's very easy to hear that in five minutes. You can basically get a sketch of the essence of Buddhism and, in fact, if you associate with Buddhist groups, you will hear it repeated endlessly. It should be in your conscious mind and works its way into your subconscious, unconscious mind. So it will be there, but it does need its support. It doesn't operate independently. The Buddha is deeply advocating the cultivation of the sublime abidings, the Brahma-viharas. There is nothing to be concerned about or afraid of. You won't get stuck. This is the type of talk you'll hear as well. Don't get attached. I find myself saying regularly over the last eight or ten years, you're already attached. There's no question of you not being attached. That is the primary condition. If you weren't attached, you wouldn't need to hear the teachings of the Buddha. You are attached, and you will be attached to good things. But through the stages of enlightenment, even the good things fade out in a very beautiful way. First of all, the moment you get a little glimpse, it's irreversible, and you're heading for home. There's no going back, and who would want to anyway? The path goes only one direction. Sometimes there are little delays and impediments along the way which make it longer or shorter, but the inevitability of finishing is certain. In fact, when the beginning of the path arises, the end of the path arises. They are separated only by time, but they are connected and it's inevitable. It's a little bit like modern physics where particles are somehow in communication with each other at a distance and cannot be separated. You hear a bit of this language sometimes about the path and the fruit. You'll hear this curious discussion of the path moment and the fruition moment and how they arise one moment apart. There's a little bit of debate sometimes between the suttas and the abhidhamma about whether your entrance into the path and the results of the path could be separated by time or whether they are right next to each other. What we can say for sure is that they basically do arise simultaneously, but could be separated by time. This just means that once you start down a road which has no other turnoffs, your destination is assured. Before that time, for instance, in the suburbs, 
especially Surrey outside of Vancouver, you can wander endlessly. 138A Street and 138B and so forth, and then 138B South, 138C North. Oh, you can get lost in there. But once you get into one of the cul-de-sacs that has no turnoffs, then you're assured of finding your friend's house where you're going to dinner. They'll usually tell you, once you hit that sign, you can't miss our house. That's quite heartening, because in the earliest stages, you don't have all that much sophistication to get to the first glimpse. Yet, from that point, there's no doubt where you're going. That's supported by some beautiful things before the first glimpse takes place. The Buddha is saying it's not just at enlightenment that good things happen. Before that, long before that, there are mundane, beautiful states, and you will be attached to them. This condition of loving kindness, profound goodwill, is addictive. You want to live in it. You never want to come out of it. By the way, that's one of the ways to know if it is truly loving kindness. You'll easily get attached to it. So be on the lookout for attachment, but not fearful of attachment. These are fortunate attachments. One fortunate attachment is meditative cultivation. And one of the most central cultivations is this emotional cultivation of the heart. Now, when you talk like this, Buddhism starts to make sense to ordinary people. Ordinary people may be kind of interested in Buddhism since it has a good reputation. But quite often, when you talk about anicca, dukkha, and anatta, the endless round of rebirth, all the suffering, etc., they don't find it very palatable. Those, however, who are eager explorers will read some of the texts and have an instant grasp that it's all about detachment. So they usually have an appreciation of emotional development or loving kindness. If you read and go on to blogs and threads on Buddhist sites, you will see this. Quite often people will be purists or think that they have the right view. It's fascinating to see all over the world people who are in their 20s discovering Buddhism in the middle of Manitoba or Minnesota, and they're finding their way through the forest of views on the web, just as the Buddha had to find his way through the forest of views in 5th century BC, India. When you actually look at the suttas, you will see this praise of the divine abidings. They can function as platforms in themselves, Platforms which lead inevitably to realization, to the liberation that is your ultimate goal. They might be especially conducive to leading you in the direction of the basic insights. So it should never be thought that this is a beginner's practice or some kind of warm-up. It is a full practice. In the various commentaries in the suttas, you will find high placement of this loving-kindness. Samsara is often described as the wandering on. The experience of life is like that. It's hard to find your home. If you're not sophisticated, you attempt to build a home. Every human has the instinct. Even the animals, of course, have the nesting instinct, the shelter instinct. They look for some place, some refuge. Humans have it as well. They take refuge in places. Sometimes they're nomadic, but the refuge there is your fellow nomads. You take refuge and you keep moving. You carry your home with you as long as you're with that group. But of course, all these things are so subject to the pressures of change. And so it is the human experience to sometimes be left homeless. Even when you seem to have a stable home, there's always anxiety and uncertainty in the background that you could lose it. You keep buying more insurance policies. But you can never shut that voice down that it's all built on sand. This is the uncertainty of samsara, the wandering on, the futile attempt to find a home when there is no home. In fact, the monks and nuns are called samanas. When they first enter and start training, they are called anagarikas, an interesting term meaning the one without a home. So we go forth into homelessness. How can we go forth into homelessness if there's no home to begin with? What we're doing is just becoming a symbol of reality. No one has a home. Everybody is homeless. Are monks more homeless than everybody else? No. 
Sometimes monks in the time of the Buddha would find a good cave and stay there the rest of their life. And it would be the villagers who were swept away by floods and had to rebuild. Who's homeless and who's not homeless? Everybody is homeless, but the monks are trying to bring it into consciousness. So daily they wear symbols, these robes, and they have bowls and so forth. These are symbols for the benefit of the monks to remind themselves with their daily recollections, you're homeless. You can't find a home. Don't even try. This also helps others who may be under the illusion that they have a home. You remember the Buddha or the Bodhisatta being impressed by the sight of the Samana, some wanderer heading off into the forest, as one of the four signs, old age, sickness, death, and a Samana. These signs are all around us, and yet people are unconscious. This is always dangerous to be living in an unconscious conceit. Not conceit in the sense that your ego is huge, but conceit about the stability of your possessions and your home, etc. The Buddha is there to say we need constant reminders, not just ideas or books, but monks living that way to constantly allow that symbol to be visible. I sometimes try to understand how things are going for organized religions in the West, especially contemplative religions. I try to look at how things are going for the Catholic Church in the West. One of the things that has happened in my lifetime is that the nuns have stopped wearing their habits. You don't see nuns out there anymore. Well, you probably do, but you don't recognize them since they aren't wearing any special garb. They don't wear the black and the white, so you don't see them. That's too bad, because they are supposed to be living reminders. In the Buddhist tradition, we haven't given up the robes. We wear these in public and in monasteries. It's functioning as a teaching device. It should strike one as a reminder that this is not a place where you live. This is a passage. Life is a passage, a train station or something like that. At the same time, I think you'll probably find that monks, if they've been monks long enough and meditating, or lay people who've been meditating and digging deeper into reality, start to become comfortable, kind of at home wherever they go. Anxiety declines because they know that home is not some particular place, but is found in letting go of attachments and fears. This is the quality of loving kindness as well. Loving kindness has a quality of home. It's something you can take with you everywhere that you abide in. That's why it's called a Brahma Vihara, the home of the gods, a much more stable, reliable, and beautiful home. The line that always comes to me is from Robert Frost about that question of home. He said, Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. That's home. He's put his finger on it, hasn't he? You know, things may not go so well, and you have your flaws, but when you think of home, it's the place where they say, Yeah, we know who you are. Come in. Come in. There's a bedroom for you. But does everyone have a place like that? We should have a house with our relatives that have to take us in. But in the real world, sometimes they die or whatever, and they're not there. So it sounds like a good idea to me to have a place where when you got to go there, they got to take you. That is metta. That is the Brahma Vihara, the divine abiding. The place which is even better than your parents' house. It's the emotional place where when you got to go there, it has to take you. You have to work on that house yourself. You have to provide unconditional acceptance a warm and welcoming and beautiful embrace of yourself. The doors are always open to you there. You're in the position of being both the one who has to take you and the one who has to knock on the door. Maybe that's what Jesus was talking about. Knock and the door shall be opened. Whose door are you knocking on? Yours. I think there's a Rumi poem. He's always funny. I have lived on the lip of insanity. Wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. 
That's loving kindness. What? You're not going to accept yourself? How could you not accept yourself? So it's the full embrace with all the warts and dandruff. That's what the loving kindness sutta goes through. If you're big, if you're small, if you're fat or far away, magnificent or ugly, it all has no bearing. You're welcome. I have to take you. The Buddha has realized this. If any being knocks, they get shelter there. He has to take them. Is that an imposition? Is that a problem? Is it dangerous? No. That's the other characteristic of loving kindness. It's safe. The more open your door is, the safer it is. When it's locked, it's dangerous. When it's locked, you can't get out of there either. When there's a fire, you can't get out. And when your door is locked, there is a fire. There's the fire of fear and anxiety and worries. And the door is locked. You're locked in. So it's only by opening the door and dropping the judgments the judgments towards oneself and others, that you are safe. The divine emotion is operative without any qualifications. Fortunately, it really is. One does not have to go through a checklist about oneself before one generates this feeling. The Buddha suggests that you go through the various categories. Sometimes they talk about all the beings to the north, the south, the various directions, large, middling, to be born, etc., All this is saying is that there are no barriers, no boundaries, no qualifications whatsoever. You don't have to ask yourself how worthy you are at all. You're in. You just show up, knock, and you're in. It's a very weird thing. This is not the way the world usually works. You usually have to get all these qualifications. When you want to go someplace to another country, they want your visa, they want this and that. You want to go to a school, they want this and that. You have to qualify for everything. Even if you want to go out on a date, you have to tell them how tall you are. So this is a very strange experience. Metta has no qualifications necessary. You are fully accepted. Metta doesn't want to know the details, doesn't want to know your past or your future. Of course, everybody's favorite monk is Angulimala, He's a serial murderer who became an arahant and slept like a baby, never had a bad dream. He's the one you could never top. How is that possible? That's not right. Surely God would strike him down or something. But not in Buddhism. He's a great character. It shows you that the way you think it operates, it doesn't. There is this kama stuff, and you do have to be very careful about what you do. But it's not about forgiveness because there's nobody to forgive you. It's just the ceasing of unskillful operations in the mind. There are unskillful operations which cease, and then you're home. And when they cease, the past, the operation of the past, and its voice disturbing you, judging you, creating a story, a life, a person, a character, is gone. That's a curious thing. It's like a magic trick. Where did it go? Where did I go? It's just that the Buddha is a great psychologist. Don't even ask, he says. It's the wrong question. If you're asking, you don't get it. It's just a process. Nothing happened. Nobody went anywhere. But we feel better. Not just better, best. You wonder if you're allowed to feel that good. Do you deserve it? Is this what humans should be doing? Shouldn't you be toiling or suffering or something? The Buddha seems to be violating a lot of rules. He's just saying, get on with it. Enjoy yourself profoundly. There are a lot of stories about the difficulty of the path, how much work the spiritual discipline is. But there are also lots of stories about people who hardly had a moment of difficulty and they just lived blissfully ever after. This is heartily endorsed by the Buddha, highly recommended. He doesn't want anybody to struggle. He's just saying, you might have to struggle to stop struggling. You might have to do a few things in order to relieve your distress. 
You can never recall too many times this beautiful invitation. If you spent the whole retreat just doing this, that would be fine. In fact, you could spend the next week, the next month, the next year, or the rest of your life just enjoying your home in heaven in the Brahma Viharas. Spend the rest of your life dwelling in a different dimension, not being so very interested in the outer play of light, which is this world. This world is just thick light. When you see it, you see it with your eyes. All you see is light, various types of light, dark and bright and green and blue and yellow. That's all. That's the world. It goes on. It plays in the background. But you don't live there. You live in a feeling. The Buddha is recommending that you live in an emotion. Don't try to live out in the world. You can't enter. It's an illusion of the mind. Somehow the brain does a three-dimensional construction and it looks like it's out there. But of course, it's inside. It's in your mind. Your mind is taking data and reconstructing it, a three-dimensional construction, which you can never get. It's a play of consciousness. But you can enter into a feeling. You can dwell in a feeling. In fact, you must. One of the things you can't avoid is feeling. It's just a matter of which one. That's also sometimes a misunderstanding on a lot of people's part that you have to be careful because you could get attached to pleasant feelings. That's more maybe to do with pizza or something. Don't get confused between pizza and the dwelling of the gods. Although that would be a good pizza parlor name, the dwelling of the gods. It's not the same. It should be clear, but apparently it's not clear. You should be a little suspicious of getting carried away with pleasant tastes and sights, not that they suddenly are all cardboard in your mouth or something like that. You're just aware of what they are. It's a pleasant sensation. It won't last. You're not trying to throw a wet blanket on anything, just knowing what it is. But these sublime spiritual emotions are in a different category. Again and again, you must reflect on the transience of all things. It shouldn't interfere, though, in any way with the divinity of that emotion. You should remain feeling safe because you're in metta. That's why loving kindness is a protection, because you feel safe. You cannot have the feeling of loving kindness, friendliness, without also the cessation of fear and anxiety, worry, and also the dries. You can't be bored, in despair, or any of those kinds of emotions, and be dwelling in the divine emotions. You can't. They are mutually exclusive. So when you're in metta, you're protected from these dreadful emotions. Those emotions are worlds. When the Buddha talks about worlds, he really means emotions. Realms of existence are emotional dimensions. None of them exist without emotional structure. They are real and have weight to them because of the feelings that are associated with them. There aren't any worlds apart from feelings. This is something to reflect on. It's very close. Dhamma sometimes can seem a long ways away. It can seem abstract and complicated. But loving kindness is something you felt, perhaps even when you were a baby or a very young child. It wasn't complicated. The Buddha is saying you've touched the divine there. Maybe as a child it was just fortunate circumstances. But childhood is over and you have to make fortunate circumstances. Not create a world around you, but create a world within you where you experience this. Create metta as a mother loves and protects her child, her only child. You're not looking for a mother. You're becoming like that mother towards yourself and towards others. That's the exercise, to learn to create an emotion. It's an invitation to art, isn't it? To making your life a work of art, of grace and beauty and love. This is the invitation of the Buddha. No wonder he was famous. We wouldn't remember him if he didn't talk like that. I think when people were around him, 
they believed it too. He just had the absolute authenticity in the voice, and he had the meta. You are welcome there. Of course, anybody who came to visit him was welcome. So reflect like this and steep in the emotion, not just a few drops of it wetting your hair or something like that. You're to drench yourself in it, soak yourself in it. You won't become dysfunctional. You will be able to walk and talk and eat. The Buddha could. All the ones who are famous for their loving kindness were perfectly able to conduct themselves in skillful, appropriate ways. There's no contradiction between the sublime emotions and the practical conduct of life. Mm -hmm. 